Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day, there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And we're going to have so much fun today because this topic that we're going to be talking about and several other things that tie into it, to me, it's very interesting. I had so much fun reading my guest's book, and we will really talk about it in depth. But please join me in welcoming Robert Jordan to our program today. Welcome, Robert. How are you? I'm doing great, Deb. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Perfect. I love it. Well, let me tell people a little bit about you and then we'll jump into this. So Robert Jordan is the CEO of Interim Execs, which matches top executives with companies around the world. Based on research with thousands of leaders and companies, he and Olivia Wagner wrote Right Leader, Right Time, Discover Your Leadership Style for a Winning Career and Company. And he and launched the FABS or FABS Leadership Assessment, a free assessment at rightleader.com, which is designed to help leaders and organizations perform better. Robert also authored How They Did It, Billion Dollar Insights from the Heart of America. And he helped publish Start With No, Jim Craig's bestseller on negotiations. So again, Robert, welcome. Thank you. Great. I have to take you everywhere with me, Deb. I know. I'm I'm just so good at reading these bios, right? <laughs> like you've done it before or something. I know. I Once or know. twice. And we're always we always sound so fabulous. Even when I read my own, I'm like, whoa, that sounds cool. <laughs> but I know me. I know. <laughs> but you have accomplished a lot in your career. So tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Well, thank you, Deb. Uh I am I'm one of your classic entrepreneurs, which is okay. to say that I've been involved in in a large number of early stage companies. Mm -hmm. That is also to say a number of them failed. <laughs> um, thank God, according to my wife, some of them worked out okay. Cool. So happy wife, years, happy life, we know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so over the years, I've been in three IPOs mm -hmm. and I was the lead person selling uh, some uh, early stage companies okay. at very high multiples mm -hmm. to uh, strategic buyers. Mm -hmm. And that all led me to um, the career I've had, mm -hmm. weird job title of, as an interim executive, but mm -hmm. now run an organization, as you said, interim mm -hmm. exec, which is a global matchmaker mm -hmm. uh, between organizations and if they have some leadership need on a project basis. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's talk about that a bit, because you mentioned a leadership need on a project basis. And of course, the company name is Interim Execs. And this fascinates me because there really is a market for part-time, temporary, you know, however they, they need it, senior executives. So tell us more about that. Yeah, this has come around. And it's interesting because, uh, especially for your American listeners, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, we Americans think, oh, we're always the first at everything. Right. We're the last. We mm -hmm. are the last at this. Because mm -hmm. uh, we always think we must hire those people full time. Yeah, it, it started in Europe, mm. um, Netherlands, and then mm -hmm. France, Germany, the UK. Mm -hmm. And so as a specialty, it's been around there 40, 50 years. Okay. It only really started coming around here uh, 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's a relentless growth now because mm -hmm. this idea of a, a resource on hand when you need it mm -hmm. is irresistible. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of use cases. You know, we were uh, trading some emails before. Mm -hmm. um, we had just um, been quoted in the Wall Street Journal because right. they're writing about the rise of fractional mm -hmm. executives. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a lot of companies would benefit from the help of a CFO, a chief financial mm -hmm. officer. But for most companies, it's not affordable. Mm 
Right. You don't need the person all the time. Mm -hmm. You'd love someone sophisticated for a little bit. Maybe you mm -hmm. have a keeper, right. a controller mm -hmm. um, for a lot of small businesses. Well, now the concept of a fractional CFO mm -hmm. is is uh, very doable mm -hmm. and affordable. Right. And and so that's how these resources are now mm -hmm. spreading out and really to the benefit of a lot of businesses. Right. Well, and it's to the benefit of the people also. Um, it was a great article in Wall Street Journal. And congratulations. You know, and, and it talked about the fact that for some of these folks, you know, they're they don't want to work full time. They might not be at an age for true retirement. So they still want to be working a bit. They want to you know, keep their brain cells active and, and things like that. Or maybe they want variety. So they do four hours here and four hours there. And, and that's what fascinates me is to think, you know, that it's so it's, it's kind of the consultant concept, but at a very high level. It's uh, yes, we distinguish it from consulting because consulting is advisory. Mm -hmm. And this is its own new specialty that mm -hmm. is operational meaning it's usually including hiring, firing, and mm -hmm. making decisions. Right. Which are the traditional mm -hmm. responsibilities of a manager or a mm -hmm. leader. Um, the executives doing this clearly are, are valuing their freedom. Mm -hmm. I have to say in our case, for our business, interim execs, we do not work with retired folks. Okay. Um, nothing against them. It's just mm -hmm. that if you think, I know a lot of your listeners own their own companies. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I, I own a number of companies. And, and if you think about who you're going to bring into your business, mm -hmm. generally speaking, you want those people hungry, eager, right? just just 24-7 mm -hmm. ready for the fight. Mm -hmm. And so not thinking against, I'm going to go fishing today or play golf or. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. So so the folks that that where where they they have that retirement mindset nothing against it but that mm -hmm. doesn't work for our model mm -hmm. right yeah you know and and i found this interesting because years ago i was on a board at a nonprofit in colorado and our our ceo resigned um you know we it was it was a good thing we knew it was coming she was just ready to to do something else but we also kind of figured it was going to take us a while to find her replacement so we hired an interim CEO, um, and I believe they were with us for six months. It, and it was the same interview process that we, you know, went through just for for the the the, the real person. But you know, and, and the concept was also, you know, that the person we hired as as interim could conceivably become the full time person. But we loved it because it got us through that gap. Um, you know, because like you said, sometimes staff are not capable of making those decisions, making those, you know, doing that leadership role. And, and so we really did need that, that part-time, you know, fill in CEO. Yes. Yeah. And you, I'm glad you bring up nonprofits because there absolutely um, is a huge use for fractional and interim right. executives at nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. And, and for us, it was a bit of a surprise because, mm -hmm. My partners and I all came from for-profit backgrounds. Mm -hmm. We were always thinking in terms of, you know, venture and funding mm -hmm. and growth right. and IPOs. And, and then these wonderful nonprofit organizations showed up, mm -hmm. terrific missions. Mm -hmm. and, and at first it was like, why are you calling us? Right. And then it was like, oh, you need great management too. Right. Got it. And you need them six hours a week. Yes. And, and so... Uh, it, it is terrific. And that that use is just going to keep mm -hmm. on going and getting bigger and bigger. Right. Part of this, I think, is a little bit demographic, which is as, you know, baby boomers, the largest mm -hmm. demographic cohort in American mm -hmm. history, uh, have crossed over where the average age is into retirement. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see a lot of leaders of both nonprofits and mm -hmm. owners of companies who are going to be retiring and it creates more of a demand Right. right. You know, and it really is something that is filling those those needs and those gaps, um, because so many companies don't need a full time person doing that, you know, and and, uh, you know, and, and but they do have a need for that skill set. And, and part of that skill set is obviously 
leadership. Um, you know, if you are a, a, an interim CFO, CMO, that is very different than being the accountant, being the marketing person, all of those things. So that leads me to your book, which is Right Leader, Right Time, Discover Your Leadership Style for a Winning Career and Company. And, you know, the premise behind it is that there's different styles that leaders have and you need different styles at different points. Um, you know, and, and that was what was so fascinating. So kind of walk us through how you and, and Olivia developed this concept. Well, you know, we we spent 15 years developing interim execs and 7,000 executives showed up on our proverbial doorstep. Mm-hmm. And at one point I started calculating, if that was at one time, that's a line about four miles long. That's a lot of people. That is. And we... We, by necessity, had to develop ranking and scoring Mm -hmm. and screening. uh, And we saw these two patterns, Mm -hmm. one pattern which was not so great and one which was. The Mm -hmm. not so great pattern was that for the majority of leaders, they, they were experiencing career journeys that were okay, but you would not describe them as great. Okay. And the flip side was, if you just look at the top two, three percent, oh my gosh, exceptional leaders. Mm -hmm. And there was this pattern of of excelling in a particular kind of thing we called leadership style, Mm -hmm. referring to a person's process and approach Mm -hmm. and system. And we saw four distinct styles. Mm -hmm. And that's when we kind of took off and sang, we have to write about this. Right. I have to write about it. This is a cautionary note mm-hmm. for people younger in their careers to say, this is what it looks like to be undifferentiated. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Right. And this is hard, but this is what successful leaders mm-hmm. do over the course of their careers. Mm-hmm. Try to do this other thing more and more. Mm-hmm. That was the impetus for right. starting to research mm-hmm. the book. You know, it, it's interesting. I had lunch today with a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in 10 years. So this was great fun. But I told her, I said, oh, I'm I'm doing this great interview this afternoon. And she, of course, said, what? And I said, well, you know, he's got he talks about these leadership styles. And I said, what happens is people are companies are not successful or leaders are not successful because what the company needs does not match the leadership style. And, you know, and, and in the, the pre-notes that, that you sent, you said that Gallup says that 90% of leaders are in the wrong role. So what the heck? <laughs> Shocking to us. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we were talking to an organizational psychologist who, mm-hmm. who cited that. And in some ways it makes sense mm-hmm. because, well, well let, let's, let's, let's look at a parallel. Okay. Uh, healthcare. Mm-hmm. medicine. Over the past hundred years, roughly 120 specialties have developed. Mm-hmm. So Deb, you and I are getting to know each other and become friends. Mm-hmm. Some point, I hope we're going to have lunch together. Mm-hmm. And if you come in and you say, I got a pain in my foot. Right. Well, if I know that there's a great podiatrist mm-hmm. down the road, I'm going to mm-hmm. say, Deb, talk to this person. Yes. I am not going to refer you to a cardiologist. I'm not <laughs> referring you to a neurologist. I'm mm-hmm. not going, I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and this sounds a little silly, but this is how sophisticated right. we as a society have become mm-hmm. in, in demands in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And the benefits of that specialization are extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Longevity, you know, right. lifespan is basically doubled in a hundred years mm-hmm. and, you know, enjoyment and relief from pain. Mm-hmm. Well, in business, if somebody does anything right, mm-hmm. oh my God, we just start thinking you can do anything. Mm-hmm. They've amassed any money doing it. Oh well, now that's now even better. Yeah, water. you know, now they're a celebrity, mm-hmm. and it's just not true. And and what we've observed among among exceptional leaders is they're there is this imprint they have Mm -hmm. over time, which becomes very unique to them. Mm -hmm. The way, because there's these four styles, Mm -hmm. we call fixer, artist, builder, strategist. At one point we thought, you know, it's it's a little like DNA. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there are only four proteins right. that make up DNA, but in infinite variation, it is determining your Aunt Mary and your favorite beagle mm -hmm. and the oak tree outside. It's just four kinds of DNA mm -hmm. that, that do that. In a way, that's what we're saying about leadership style. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to pigeonhole anyone into only one. Right. We are definitely saying that among exceptional leaders, there tends to be a mm -hmm. dominant and a secondary. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's talk about each one. So, you know, the, you, the, it's fixer, artist, builder, strategist. Um, and so tell us, <coughs> excuse me, more about each one. And then we'll, we'll start going from there. Fixer is the energy that you love running into the burning building. Okay. What we mean here, though, fixer energy as leader is, you need to keep running into more and mm -hmm. more burning buildings. Right. So an example uh, a lot of your listeners may have heard of is that mm -hmm. there's been a huge bankruptcy called FTX. Mm -hmm. Crypto exchange went right. into bankruptcy a couple months ago. And not surprisingly, the court appointed an interim CEO mm -hmm. named John Ray. Mm -hmm. And what was John Ray's background? Enron. Ah, he was brought in to clean up Enron. Mm -hmm. That's what you tend to see for a fixer leader is right. they need to go from one crisis to another. Mm -hmm. And that that kind of fixation is their energy. Mm -hmm. Artist. Mm -hmm. Artist is the energy that sees the world as a blank canvas or a piece of clay. Mm -hmm. the, the artist style, this is the person on your team who's the renegade, the rebel. They're going, the what if? What if the we do what this? If. They're mm -hmm. they're they're not the most popular one. They can mm -hmm. be discontented. They they can bug you, but they come up with these off the wall, discontinuous <laughs> things that sometimes are hey. like, wait a minute, why didn't we think of that? Mm -hmm. Stagnant organizations. Mm -hmm. The solution is always artist energy. Okay. Standout leader in the world today that everyone knows is Elon Musk. Right. And I'm referring specifically to Tesla and SpaceX. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about Twitter in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he he's a cautionary note because Twitter does not follow his model. Mm -hmm. And predictably, he's having incredible right. difficulty mm -hmm. with it. Builder. Now, I know everybody in business, we're all builders. Got mm -hmm. it. Uh, we mean something specific, which is the energy that can take the small, nascent product service mm -hmm. team, client relationship, and take it to scale to a point mm -hmm. of market domination. What you see with builder energy is that when that person, that leader has reached the high point, mm -hmm. they tend to want to rotate off. Mm -hmm. If it's an IPO, they tend to leave right then okay. to go do it again somewhere mm -hmm. else. Uh, they, they do not tend to want to stick around once things mm -hmm. are. They're are kind of the serial plateau. entrepreneurs. That is one use case is mm -hmm. serial entrepreneurs in many cases can be like that. But it's also not on not just entrepreneurs. There right. are many people within larger organizations mm -hmm. where where this is the way mm -hmm. they express their careers. Mm -hmm. Strategist is the leader at scale. Strategist is mm -hmm. the leader within a complex or vast organization. Mm -hmm. And the language of these four styles, when you start drilling into this, it's dramatically different. Strategist, for example, will talk about loyalty to the organization. Mm -hmm about having been mentored, about mm -hmm. mentoring, about being cross-trained, mm -hmm. about gratitude toward, to the organization, mm -hmm. about how you move the vast middle. Mm -hmm. You don't hear any of that from fixer, artist, and builder. Right, because it doesn't really pertain to them. It doesn't pertain. Uh, one of the leaders we interviewed for the book uh, was the former undersecretary of the Department of Defense. Mm. And the Department of Defense, you're talking about over a million people. Right. And uh, her name's Janine Davidson, and Dr. Davidson talked about you're at this level of systems of systems, mm -hmm. and you are operating at a level of nuance that may sound uh, not that significant, mm -hmm. but over something that vast that over time can have huge effects mm -hmm. to your decisions. Right. Right. Does that give you a picture of the four? It, it does. You know, and, and it was so interesting as I was reading your book because you give lots of great examples. 
And, and I always like examples because then we can look at it and go, Ooh, that's me. That's so-and-so all of those things. And, and of course, Elon Musk did, you know, he was, he was kind of the one that, that leaped to my mind and it's not hard to see just from knowing, you know, the media reports, all those things that he is truly an artist. He's that visionary, the person who's seeing us going to space, seeing the electric cars, all of those things. And, you know, we mentioned just, you know, a couple minutes ago that you get the wrong leader in a position and it's horrible. And so he goes into Twitter and his his role there is to be the fixer. And that to me is, you know, almost the opposite of the artist. And, and I think it's it's been very easy then once we, we see this to understand why this is not working. Right, right. And, and, and let's be clear here in, in not pigeonholing people. Mm-hmm. All leaders, you bring all of your capabilities right. to bear mm-hmm. to be successful. And so if I can use myself as an example, I've owned companies my whole life. Mm -hmm. I have to solve problems every day, Mm -hmm. but I don't get my energy off of it. Right. I don't say, oh man, please bring me the Mm -hmm. next person. That's Mm -hmm. not my wiring. Mm -hmm. And and so we can pick on we can pick on Elon a little here Mm -hmm. because it's so obvious Mm -hmm. to everyone. And in the end, I hope he is successful. I Mm -hmm. hope Twitter emerges as an even more successful organization. Mm -hmm. But it, it, for me, for the rest of us in the mm-hmm. world who lead is a cautionary tale, mm-hmm. which is that, especially if you're wired as a fixer, right. you're not going to be doing what he did and being successful. No, no. He may get a free pass mm-hmm. um, for, for many reasons, but the classic playbook mm-hmm. for the fixer, as bad as things can be in those organizations, mm-hmm. is, is the first thing we'll always hear from fixers is you go in and you listen. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and we generally will hear from fixers that the second thing you do is you go down as deep in the organization Mm -hmm. as you can. If they're manufacturing, you are talking to the guys in the shop. shop floor. You're Mm -hmm. talking to the administrative assistants who have been there forever Mm -hmm. and they've been discounted because of an organization that is broke. It's broke from the top up Mm -hmm. from 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 the top on down. And Mm -hmm. so. So if you're just going in talking to the board or firing mm-hmm. the board and the management team, uh, you're missing it. Right. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I worked for, uh, back when I was in corporate America, I worked for a large financial company. And our CEO, at least once a week, would go down to the mail room. Now, he liked the guys in the mail room, but he would go down and say, what you hearing? You know, and and because people weren't going to come to him. I mean, it was it was always interesting when he would walk the halls because we lived in cubicle world. And so, you know, the the five foot walls and he was six foot. So you could see him. I mean, it was, you know, and 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 it just panicked everybody. You know, what's he what's he doing? Why is he here? Um, you know, and, and so he couldn't just pop in and say, hey, Robert, how you doing? What you doing today? Because you would have gone. Why are you here? You're here to fire me. What's going on? Um, but he did. He went down into the mail room and would just, you know, and, and of course, those guys truly had their finger on the pulse of what was going on because they worked directly with all of the admin assistants and the secretaries. And those women, I think it was all women. I mean, this is long enough ago that, you know, we might have had a couple men. But of course, those women knew exactly what was going on with every single person in their department, both personal and from a business perspective. And so it was just very interesting to see how that worked because he just he really loved it. He liked getting in there and just finding out from the people who knew what the heck was going on. You're 100 percent right. This this reminds me at one point I heard the former CEO of Caterpillar give a speech. And at one point he he said he had this expression assigned by his desk and it said, the back of his desk is a terrible place from which to lead. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, uh, yeah, so absolutely true. Yeah. You know, I, I've shared this on the program before too. I am from Colorado. So, you know, Denver Broncos are, are my team. And Peyton Manning came after I left, um, but it was it was so fascinating because I think 
he is definitely one of those people who, you know, quarterbacks are supposed to be leaders. I mean, you know, that's kind of their, their role, but he took it several steps further. And, and I, you know, knew some, some sports reporters. And so I knew what they were telling me was correct. So he, he moved from Indianapolis to Denver before his family did. They had to finish school year and all that good stuff. And so he actually lived at the football headquarters. They had, you know, there, there was a place there. And, and so he lived there for a while. And one of the things that he had them do was put together a notebook that had, it was basically a dossier of every single person. It had their pictures. It had, you know, they have four dogs, two cats, you know, all of these various things and their, their kids' names are, you know, Billy Sue and, and, um, you know, and, and all, and from janitors up, you know, all the way Mm -hmm. up to Pat Bowen and his, and, and of course he went through and he, he studied that just like it was a playbook and he memorized it. And I remember somebody asked him why, and he said, you know, some of the best things come from the janitors. And he really did just understand that you needed to talk to people at every single level. And I think he, you know, he paid attention to the higher ups, but that wasn't, you know, he knew he was going to get more from, from everybody else. I love that story. It's terrific. Yeah. And and I think we we just, just, yeah, we see that going forward with him. I mean, he is, you know, he's, he's just that type of of person. Yeah. You know, you want to apply that to business. Mm -hmm. Um, We, we had done a book. Uh, about 10 years ago, it was mm-hmm. a series of interviews with champion company founders. Mm-hmm. And when we interviewed Dane Miller, he was the founder of a company called Biomet. So mm-hmm. any of your listeners, if you happen to have an artificial hip or an artificial knee, you have Dane Miller to think. He was mm-hmm. one of the original inventors mm-hmm. of, of the technology. Mm-hmm. And he insisted that every person in the company had mm-hmm. to have equity. Mm-hmm. Everyone. They Janitors had skin in the up. game. Yeah. Yeah. And another, you know, to Peyton's story, one of the things he would do, and this is after they had thousands of employees Mm -hmm. and a campus, is that sometimes when there are job interviews uh, with executives, he would not pretend exactly. Mm -hmm. He would offer to go pick people up at the airport. Mm. And if they didn't happen to catch his name or they weren't Mm -hmm. paying attention or whatever, Mm -hmm. they didn't know they were being chauffeured over to the plant to the headquarters Mm -hmm. by the founder and CEO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you don't always know who those people are. You don't, and you don't necessarily take note. Mm -hmm. Just You can imagine some Mm -hmm. of those conversations. Right. If you like driving the bus around the Mm -hmm. campus. Yeah, and just listening to people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the the CEO that I mentioned that I work for, one of the other things he did was – you know, it's, it was a secure building. So you had to badge in to, to get into the the thing. And so everybody had, and you had to have your badge on all the time. Um, And so, you know, I had your picture and and your name and he had us redo every single badge so that the person's first name was a very large font so that he could read it from six ish feet away. And, you know, and, and we were all thinking, well, this is a big waste of money and time. But it was phenomenal because when he would call people by name, they were like, he knows who I am. He could read. Never, nobody ever got this. They didn't understand that it was simply because he could read. Um, and But it it was that little personal step that he did that you know made him a good leader. But you know, then the company went through acquisitions and trend you know, and all this, and he no longer fit the right role. And it was, it was uncomfortable. Um, we had, you're going to love this. We had co-CEOs for a while. And that was really fun, you know, because you had your two companies that merged. And so you had mom and you had dad. And, and if dad didn't tell you what you wanted, then you went to mom, right? <laughs> and, and it really was to see who's going to come out on top, um, you know, and, and, but yeah, it was, it was, it was very interesting because the, the higher ups never stop to think who's who's the who has the skills to be in the role. Yes. You yeah. know, it was just who- by the way, your your example of uh, your wonderful CEO mm-hmm. uh, reminds me of something like my, my daughters as they've gone on job interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll say to them, just understand the most important word in the English language. Mm-hmm. It's your own name. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you, you, they're young and, you know, right. 
they're nervous and mm -hmm. all of that. And just hey, understand that this other mm -hmm. person, the most important word to them yep. is their own name. Yeah. So your CEO mm -hmm. acknowledging is mm -hmm. it's it's not just a little right. thing or an affect. Mm -hmm. This reminds me, you know, Stephen Covey, uh, you know, Seven Habits, uh, you know, a, the the line that always stuck out, heard him do audio programs when mm -hmm. he was alive. And the line that always stuck out is he would say the deepest desire of the human spirit is to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You know, and it's interesting with the different, the four different styles, because to me, you know, when I look at those, I'm going to, I see some of those, they're not going to care about that. You know, you mentioned that, you know, the strategist cares about loyalty. The artist doesn't care that he's in the elevator with Bob and Sue. You know, it's just, it's just not in his realm of, of what he cares about. So that's, that is just kind of part of this whole thing is what, what is important and what is the, the right role for that time? Yeah, you're right. We we don't want to make any claims though on personality, right? Because um, that is think, different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is an overlay that mm -hmm. you know we are now testing out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in addition to the book, there's this free leadership assessment, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. which is coming out, and it is to see well how does this play mm -hmm. with other more traditional measures right. of personality mm -hmm. and affect and intelligence. Mm -hmm. And well, I'll give you an example of something that we think is a trait mm -hmm. that we're testing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We write in the book that fixer and builder appear to us to be more linear. Right. Yeah. They're Meaning, getting us from A to B to C. Yes. And they also tend to work on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. One company. So John Ray, to go back to him from FTX, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you he's not working on any other company while he's Mm -hmm. while he's working on dissolving FTX. Right. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk, on the other hand, artist energy must have multiple outlets. Right. Mm -hmm. So even if you put aside Twitter and say, oh my God, mm -hmm. it's a disaster. Yeah, he's done Tesla and you know several other he things all at the same time. Mm -hmm. SpaceX and Boring Company at the mm -hmm. same time because it's a kind of energy that must, mm -hmm. must play out on multiple mm -hmm. canvases. And artists... Uh, in the the more literal sense, are the same way. You know, if mm -hmm. you read about an artist like Monet, right? He was working on fifteen mm -hmm. canvases of haystacks mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. They're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Every fifteen minutes, the light would change, and he could somehow figure out. Mm -hmm. You know, he was switching canvases. For right. the rest of us, it would be like, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Oh, eh, eh. <laughs> Yeah. So we say that, mm -hmm. that artist and strategist are parallel mm -hmm. and that fixer and builder are linear mm -hmm. or linear. And the assessment is is a test of that mm -hmm. to see how this resonates mm -hmm. with people as they take it. And in fact, does it describe them mm -hmm. to their satisfaction? Right. So you know, one of the things that struck me as, as I was reading your book was you know, in many ways, you are talking about the person that goes in, does whatever the role is needed, and then they go on to their next project or company or, or whatever. How does it work when you are the business owner, the business founder, where you can't say, I mean, you know, yes, we talked about serial entrepreneurs, but if you are saying, I'm going to stay with this company forever, how does it work if you know, you, you are predominantly one of those four styles when that's not needed at your company at that point in time? Well, it's a great question. Um, there's a phrase we love, we put in the book, um, highest and best use. Mm -hmm. And, and our observation is that exceptional leaders tend to reject more mm -hmm. of what is not for their highest and best use. Okay. And so, um, I think I'm an example because I'm a company owner. Mm -hmm. I am certainly not trying to be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. I'm not great at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do very much is to reject all of the things at which I'm anything other than what I think is world class mm -hmm. and to and to surround myself mm -hmm. with people who are far, far better than I am at so many things. Mm -hmm. 
and to be humble enough to try to collaborate to the point that they shine mm -hmm. and that they advance. Because at the end of the day, I think it's the only way we're going to grow as a business. Mm -hmm. If it is not all about me right. and it's not about my ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very hard for a lot of owners. Right. And for a lot of people that start, especially small companies, you know, if 20 years later, they're doing the exact same things. Well, now you're looking at burnout. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we we talk about this a lot on the program that especially someone who founds a business, you know, launches a business, they think they have to do it all. And in some cases, part of that is because they can't afford to hire some of those other things. And and But it really is a matter of, okay, you're, you need to stay in your wheelhouse, you know, and, and hire those things done, even if it's going to cost you. Um, you know, I, I just launched a, a, an initiative last year to, to help those who um, are on their journey with cancer. And, you know, my company builds websites, we do brand development, all of those things. But I took one look at this and was working with a business coach. Say, so here's the thing. Somebody helped me in this thought process. And I knew that if I wanted it to be done and be done more quickly, in other words, meet deadlines, I needed to hire it done. And so I hired a brand strategist. I hired a business coach. I hired a website developer. All of those things that I could do, but I knew if I tried to do it myself, more than likely it wasn't even going to get done. But if it did get done, it was going to be eh. But by hiring those experts, it's like, holy schmoly, this is pretty cool. You're a perfect example. Perfect example. We won't of, say how many years it took me to come to that realization. <laughs> well, this is the beauty of, mm -hmm. of uh, each of us on our journey. Mm -hmm. That it it's, it's just not given to any of us. It's not revealed right. instantly. You can have mm -hmm. epiphanies, but it's generally... Mm -hmm. Uh, you you know you saw you read the book mm -hmm. uh, Deb and we quote a minister mm -hmm. in there and who said just because you have a song to sing doesn't mean you don't have to learn how to sing it right and you know so we come to this and this is the beauty of the modern age mm -hmm. which is so many resources are available to mm -hmm. all of us that do not require full time hiring mm -hmm. and uh, we couldn't have written this book thirty years ago right. It, it didn't. Right. Yeah. Because 30 exist. years ago, baby boomers went must get job, must stay with job forever. Exactly. And and that was the model of our parents, which is, mm -hmm. man, I wish I could get a job at General Motors for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And the modern world is Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, giving the speech to new employees to say, we know this is just essentially a mm -hmm. term of a tour of duty for you. Right. You may be with us for a long time, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. And so we just want that to be the greatest ex experience mm -hmm. for you and the company that it can be. Right. That's a radically different mm -hmm. mindset on work. Mm -hmm. I, I read a quote the other day, someone who said, I don't view my career anymore as a stairway or a ladder. I think it's a jungle gym. And it wasn't <laughs> necessarily a bad thing. They weren't mm -hmm. saying it like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. They were just saying my career is going to be long. And it's going to be varied and there's going to be this journey mm -hmm. of discovery and I'm going to be the one to figure out where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And it doesn't have to be this, this thing that looked like this mm -hmm. relentless traditional mm -hmm. rungs up a ladder. Right. And it, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the person. I mean, you know, it used to be that, you know, we would have looked at their resume and gone, Ooh, yeah. job hopper, what's wrong? What do they do? And now we're like, oh, okay, he got this skill set here and this skill set here and this skill set here and bringing them all together to work with us for a while. And then he's going to go off somewhere else. You see surveys of of how workers feel about work these days mm -hmm. and the motivations are dramatically different right. than they used to be, mm -hmm. which which used to be around security and income. Mm -hmm. And now they are so much around freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. and and around growth mm -hmm. yeah and employers have to take note mm -hmm. they do right if you think you are just motivating somebody because you're dangling the check you are missing a whole lot right, right. and then we had a pandemic <laughs> you know? and you know and and it it really was I think it it 
highlighted, magnified, whatever we want to call it. You know, they, they, you know, this, this term, you know, the great resignation (laughs) that's been happening folks. Um, But obviously it, you know, it, it uh, put it on the fast track. And I think so many people really went, Ooh, you know, so did you see that in the, in the last two ish years that people really went, okay, you know, I want to do what makes my soul happy. Well, we saw directly in, you know, in our business interim execs that it Mm -hmm. it accelerated on both sides, more Mm -hmm. and more companies discovering it as a resource and more and more executives who wanted Mm -hmm. to do this as career. Right. Not as sideline, not Mm -hmm. as in between permanent Mm -hmm. roles, but this is what they wanted to determine as Mm -hmm. their career. Well, there's another model Mm -hmm. which has been around this way for a long time, which is the movie industry. Ah, true. And, you know, we accept and, you know, you think about a movie set or if it's a streaming series Mm -hmm. that hundreds of professionals come together. There are Mm -hmm. finance, there's accounting, there's production, there's the stars in front, which are just one of a vast Mm -hmm. number. There's the key grips, there's the cinematographer, Mm -hmm. all of these roles. Mm -hmm. Come together, make the best product that you can. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? They (laughs) disband. Mm -hmm. They disband. And it doesn't mean they've lost their jobs, that they've lost their Mm -hmm. callings. No, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. They have another credential. Mm -hmm. They've had another learning experience and relationships, and they all move on to the next movie, to the next production. Mm -hmm. And this is the way that industry works. Right. And it works well. (laughs) Yeah, it obviously works very well. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's interesting when you look, because sometimes they do develop kind of teams, you know, and, and, you know, whether it's, you know, certain actors like to work with other actors or, you know, your, your, you know, your tech people all, but, but it is, you know, they're going from project to project to project. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I think one of the other things that COVID showed us was obviously that you, you didn't have to be in an office, physically sit at a desk for 40 ish hours a week. Um, you know, how many companies went, wow, you know, now that they're home, they're getting everything done in 30 hours. Are we going to try and make them do that other 10 hours or are we going to go cool? You got it done in 30 hours. <laughs> Yeah, there were. It, it, this could be a measurement bias, but productivity went up mm-hmm. uh, as a result. Right. You know, and, and I think part of that was obviously you didn't have the people popping into offices and you know going down the hall and talking about the football game and um, you know and, and talking about the Ohio State. And I say that because I know you were Michigan grad. Um, and really going to throw that at me, are you? I know, I know, and I always love how it's the Ohio State. But you know, I went to University of Colorado, so. Hey, we we're gonna have a good football year, but you know, let's. <laughs> um, but you know, you so you didn't have those distractions, and even now, if you do, you know, it's it's on you know Zoom or whatever that the thing is, and it's quick and it's fast. But we're also missing those. Hey, you know, what do you think about that football game? And I had a, an idea for a project we should be working on, so that that those interactions were missing, and and it's uh, you know. I, it's going to be interesting to see how this all shakes down, but I think we're going to have a lot more flexibility, a lot more interim, you know, a lot more things like that. Yes. It's uh, there's no indication we're going back in any mm-hmm. way right. to an old model. Mm-hmm. This is, this, the this is the way that it is and it plays to people's freedom. Right. You know, and when companies say, Hey, we're going to make you come back in, they get huge pushback. Um, right. you know, and, and, and it's interesting because I've had some people tell me, especially when it first started, you know, and it was, and that was interesting, right. You know, people were at work on Friday and not on Monday, you know, and there was no time to prepare all sorts of things, but you know, they, I had business owners and, and managers and people say, I don't trust them now. And we heard about it all the time where they would put, you know, things on their computers to be, you know, and, and all of those. And I asked one person, I said, did you trust them when they were in the office? And he said, yeah. And I said, so, you know, now if you didn't trust him in the office, that was a totally different issue. But I said, you know, if they're getting the work done, does it matter if it's 11 a.m. or 11 p.m.? 
you know, or on a Saturday or a weekend or whatever, as long as they're getting the work done. And yeah, the, it, the, the seat in the desk was an affect of the mm -hmm. industrial age of punching right. the time clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the vast majority of us are in some form of information mm -hmm. work, which just doesn't have to be that way. Right. Anymore. Yeah. Now it is tricky. I mean, like the other night, our internet went down. Oh, gasp. What do we do? <laughs> yeah. um, now it was five o'clock at night, so not a huge deal. But, you know, there there's obviously things that, that happen. But yeah, I think when businesses realized <coughs> that their productivity really is going up, or at least not declining, it you know this this remote work is is good plus you don't have a lot of the expenses associated with business you know with the physical building all sorts of things like that yes you, you know i think what comes as a benefit because so many of us are remote or hybrid is productivity can go up mm -hmm. freedom can go up um there is also the possibility that collaboration can go up mm -hmm. It is not the same, obviously, as when you're in the same building and you right. knock on somebody's door and you mm -hmm. go in. Um, but it is one of the traits that we saw, that we see among exceptional leaders is they're better collaborators. Mm -hmm. They're better collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully this identification of more, you know, playing into your strength, mm -hmm. right. into right. what we would call your highest and mm -hmm. best use. Um, is accompanied by more and better collaboration. Right. And and these tools do, you know, I, I like face-to-face. -face, I like real mm -hmm. content. We, we, we have advanced, you know, Zoom is a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, people may get Zoom fatigue, but it definitely made uh, mm -hmm. all of us having to go remote easier. Right. Yeah, and I mean, there were obviously growing pains. I mean, you know, I they, they, just for lack of a better term, <coughs> you know, people who didn't have space for a home office or, <coughs> you know, didn't have the computer, internet, all those things, you know, and, and so once we kind of worked out those bugs and there were still things I was talking to, to someone who was on a hybrid. And so she was in her office Tuesday and Thursday and home Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And she said, invariably, wherever I am, the file I need is in the other place. <laughs> and so, you know, once we got used to that, I think, you know, it really has been a benefit. And, and like we said, you know, now we're determining, you know, you might be the CEO, the CFO, but, you know, you really aren't working 40 hours a week, eight hours a day. Now you might want to, but maybe you can do it for two different companies. Yes. You're going to see more and more of that. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are a lot of folks who, you know, we did a survey of 200 interim executives and 62% said that they were currently working for two or more firms, mm -hmm. which by definition is fractional. Right. So do you find that, and this, this just popped into my head, I have no idea why, but that they might have their business one and then the other one is maybe volunteer time. Um, you know, they might they might serve as the CEO or CFO or whatever of a nonprofit, but they've got their business part or is it business business or, you know, just kind of a big mixture of all of the above? Well, in our survey, it was all of their business roles for which they were being paid. OK, so the majority fractional, they're getting paid from multiple okay. clients. Mm -hmm. um, it does happen, though that for the vast majority of these folks, to your point, mm -hmm. they're serving on boards, they're serving on nonprofits. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually an interesting question. We haven't directly surveyed that that we should. We're, we're in touch with thousands of, mm -hmm. of executives to find out exactly how many boards and how many nonprofit mm -hmm. organizations they're working for. Right. I mean, the, the, the good news here is, is that most of these leaders are dedicating significant time to, mm -hmm. to, to worthy causes. Right. Or their families or yeah. golf. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it, it did make me think, you know, what, what about, you know, and, and it was, it, it was, it was interesting to be thinking, you know, maybe they can split their time. And then of course, you know, there are the, the tricky things, the, the legal things where you probably should not be working for two 
companies that are doing the same thing. Now, obviously, it depends on what you're doing. Um, and there's NDAs and there's there's all sorts of things. But yeah, you're probably not going to be doing you know this one and this one just you know because it, it gets a little bit tricky. But in especially in the case of say a CFO or a CMO, you can you know it, you can have very different hats and work for very different companies and and be very successful at what you're doing. Yes, you, this is also a bit of an advertisement for our organization. Mm-hmm. Interim Execs is the company name. Mm-hmm. The team is called Red Team. Red, mm-hmm. Red stands for Rapid Executive Deployment. Ah. And essentially, that is a collective around mm-hmm. the world of hundreds of mm-hmm. exceptional executives. Right. And conflict, mm-hmm. um, to be conflicted out, for example, is a very big reason why mm-hmm. uh, executives want to be part of something bigger. Right. But I think because we are you know, we, we, we're pack animals, Mm -hmm. not just your beagles, you know, we (laughs) humans are pack animals Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of reasons why a collective Mm -hmm. makes sense. But one of them is, is that executives, you do get conflicted out Mm -hmm. and um, for a variety of reasons, Mm -hmm. you know, could be that uh, conflict is at board service Mm -hmm. could be from prior companies. um, But but it absolutely fuels, fuels the collective nature of what our mm-hmm. team does. Right. So, Robert, I was telling you before that the program started, when I was looking through fixer, artist, builder, strategist, you have uh, traits that each style has. And as I was reading this, I thought, I don't fit into any of these as you know, kind of a predominant type of, of thing. And it was more like, OK, well, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. Do you find, you know, obviously there are some people that are very clearly a fixer, an artist, a builder, a strategist. But what about those of us that are the bright, shiny object people that kind of flit from here to there? We buckle down when we have to, and we might actually even enjoy it. So, you know, for, what about those of us that don't fit neatly into the categories? Well, it's a great point, And we're going to learn as the research goes on. Uh, what that is like, there are um, some leaders who clearly in the course of their careers have had all at at Mm -hmm. various or different points. So, for example, Fred Smith just retired from FedEx. Mm -hmm. 51 years. Wow. Between the chairman and the CEO roles. Mm -hmm. Now, 51 years ago or from from uh, his leaving, Mm -hmm. he started because you know he created a term paper mm-hmm. right and and went oh hey this looks pretty good let's 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 do this that's a lot of artist energy mm-hmm. you know to dream up the idea of right. let's let's use an airplane to deliver mm-hmm. a package mm-hmm. you know, and say and it can get somewhere overnight yeah and we've all you know a lot of people have seen him on 60 minutes talking mm-hmm. about how he had to go to las vegas mm-hmm. and gamble to make payroll <laughs> Well, if that isn't fixer energy, right? You know, uh-huh. That is definitely not builder or strategist. You know, yeah, their heads would know, explode. Mm-hmm. Who who was the primary mover in terms of a market form of market domination taking on the U.S. Postal Service mm-hmm. as a builder? Ultimately, he arrived at strategist, right? To to be the chairman and CEO of an organization with hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of employees, something so complex. 150 plus mm-hmm. countries. And so there you could say, well, there's a guy that rounded the bases mm-hmm. of, of the four styles. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for a lot of people, they may identify with one more than the other. Mm-hmm. And it could be that it is um, somewhat situational. Mm-hmm. I am an example of I'm an extreme, in my case, an artist mm-hmm. mode. And we write about this in the book because in some ways it's to my peril. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't stop thinking of, of new products and services. Right. When I'm with friends who have companies, mm-hmm. I'm thinking up, I can't stop thinking mm-hmm. of like, oh, gee, this should be your next marketing mm-hmm. campaign and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. And, and there's no off button. There's no off button. Mm-hmm. For the artist, and it's not necessarily that you're maximizing your income, your mm-hmm. your your status um, by having to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, we would say fixer is more of of a discovered mm-hmm. style, 
which is you're at work early in your career, you're smart, you're mm -hmm. high energy, you're not all that differentiated. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem somewhere, different division, different country, mm -hmm. different clients. Mm -hmm. Someone says, let's throw Deb at it. She's smart. No one else could solve it. Right. Deb has no and, knowledge about it, but. <laughs> and and you go in and you crush it. Mm -hmm. And and if you're hooked, mm -hmm. if that's, you know, your drug right. of choice, well, mm -hmm. now you need to do that again and you mm -hmm. can't go back to steady state. Right. Mm -hmm. So some of these Deb, maybe things to think about in terms of the the negative sense. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if if the more steady state or gradual rise doesn't get to you that mm -hmm. much, well, those are indicators of fixer and artist, right? Um, uh, in terms of energy, and so mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'll be interesting. Love to see it when you take the assessment. I need to, mm -hmm. and and. Um, you know, we're still what I would call a beta, but it'll mm -hmm. be interesting how you feel when you see those mm -hmm. questions. Uh, and, you know, at some point with a lot of these, we we take lots of profiling kind mm -hmm. of tests because, you know, we're discovering and all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. I view it as self-discovery. And right. so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what I'd hope for you mm -hmm. is you view it as self-discovery to right. see. And that, of course, you're going to be a combination, mm -hmm. though. Mm -hmm will be right. a combination. Right. Yeah, because most people are. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. So. And listen, well, I'm going to tell you that, mm -hmm. that given the fact of what you do, mm -hmm. because you are amazing and have been podcasting for 10 years, you have artist energy in you. Oh, yeah. You have to. Mm -hmm. it, it's not only the creative impetus because you created it, but because you have such a broad open mind mm -hmm. and, and curiosity and it's as if, you know, the canvases are your guests, mm -hmm. you know, right. on which you mm -hmm. are painting. Right. And and so at least part of the answer, I think, for you is mm -hmm. there's artist energy. Right. In there. And when I have to be those others, you're right. I'm like, Ugh. Oh, yeah. I'll do it. But or not to pigeonhole you, but it'll be interesting to keep yeah. talking. Yeah. You know, and, and but as as we said, what what is best is when we're smart enough to hire and work with those who fill those other roles and compliment us. So, oh my gosh, Robert, this has been so much fun. We have to have you on again, because I was thinking, you know, this would be a great program to talk about, you know, okay, you're a new college graduate, you know, yeah. what, yeah, what do you need to do? So I think that'd be a, a great follow-up program. But until then, you know, tell people how they find you. What are the services that you provide? Um, obviously, we talked about the book, Right Leader, Right Time. Discover your leadership style for a winning career and company. But talk to us about your company and, and then how people can reach out to you. I can be reached. Thanks, Deb. I can be reached at interimexecs.com. And uh, the company Interim Execs, it, it's a global matchmaker between organizations, whether they're for-profit or nonprofits, that have leadership needs. That is across, you know, it's called the C-suite, just mm -hmm. like your C-suite network. And in terms of thinking of roles like CEO, CFO, CIO. Um, and, uh, you, you know, that's what we do. Our, our, our goal with that organization is be the best matchmaker in the world. I love it. We have a motto. Mm -hmm. And and the motto is perfect or not at all. Ah, I love it. Very yeah, cool. It's a it's a private mm -hmm. business that mm -hmm. my partners and I own, and and our feeling is, look, we're not a public company. Mm -hmm. We don't have to keep on. You don't have showing. shareholders that you have to please. You yeah, can do it the way to you want. Record mm -hmm. profits every quarter going mm -hmm. up and up and up. It's it's a question of are we doing just incredibly good work, and if it mm -hmm. makes sense between the organization and the team or the executive, mm -hmm. then let's do it. But if it doesn't, don't push right. on anything. Don't do mm -hmm. it. Go ahead. Right. Don't. So. Very cool. Thank you. Well, Robert, this really has been so much fun. And as I said, well, we'll have to have you on again. But do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave everyone with? Well, I'm going to repeat one thing for, for uh, all your wonderful listeners, um, which is not easy, but I'm going to say it anyway to repeat it, which is exceptional leaders tend to reject more of what is not for their highest and best use. And not easy, but if you can if you can do this just a little more and a little more, 
kind of keep doubling down into the things at which you are great and you love, you're going to have more and more success. I love it. Well, I have been having such a fascinating discussion with Robert Jordan. I'm Deb Creer. And until next time, everyone have a great day. Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.